Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. In 1951, the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup for the fourth time in five years, playing the Montreal Canadiens in a best of seven. Each of the first four games went into overtime. Toronto won three of those games, and Game 5 wasn't any different. Overtime would be needed. At the 2.53 mark, Bill Barilko scored to give the Leafs a 3-2 win and the Stanley Cup championship. It was to be the last goal he would ever score. Next on Sports Forgotten Heroes, Bill Barilko, Part 2. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Thanks for tuning in to Sports Forgotten Heroes. In just a moment, hockey historian and author Kevin Shea will be joining me to continue our conversation about Bill Barilko. Now, if you didn't listen to part one, I suggest you do. However, in the meantime, I'll bring you up to speed quickly. Bill Barilka was called up to the Toronto Maple Leafs with 18 games remaining in the 1946-47 season, and he promptly helped lead the Leafs to the Stanley Cup championship. In fact, it would be the first of three straight Stanley Cups that Toronto would win, becoming the first team to ever do so. And they won a fourth cup in five years when, in overtime of Game 5, Barilko scored a cup-clinching goal to give the Leafs a four-games-to-one win over the Montreal Canadiens. It's what happened after the 1951 Finals that makes this such an incredible story. First, I want to remind you all, you can learn more about Sports Forgotten Heroes at SportsFH.com. You can support the show at patreon.com backslash sportsfh. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com backslash sportsfh. You could follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at sportsfheroes. And we also have a page on Facebook, Sports Forgotten Heroes. Kevin Shea just finished writing the 100th anniversary book of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and earlier he wrote the definitive biography on Bill Barilko called Barilko. Continuing our conversation, I asked Kevin about the fact that Barilko scored the cup-clinching goal by disobeying Coach Joe Primo's directive of not rushing the puck. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely right. Well, it was quite a season again. You know, Bill had had the challenges during the season that I mentioned, but uh, but cleaned up his act and, and continued and, and had a, a very good season all in all. Um, but they go into the playoffs and, and you know, they get to the Stanley Cup final against the Montreal Canadiens. And it's, uh, it's going to be a, a series for all time. You know, the Montreal Canadiens, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the only two Canadian teams in the league at that particular time. They hadn't played each other in the Stanley Cup final for a number of years beforehand, and here they go. Both had dynamic teams. And every single game goes into overtime. It has to be decided in extra in extra time, that particular final. Really quite unusual. And, and so here they go. The Leafs are up uh, three games to one going into game five, and uh, and they're down. They're down a goal late in the period, and uh, so so uh, Joe Primo pulls his goaltender. Todd Sloan scores a late goal in the third period to tie up the game at that particular time, and wouldn't you know it, this fifth game in a row goes into overtime again. Well, Bill had taken some chances. Again, he wasn't an offensive defenseman, but he was a he was a risk taker at times. And so Joe Primo sat him down and said, "Look at Bill. I don't want you crossing the center ice line." I don't want you, or you'll be fined 50 bucks, which was a considerable amount of money at that time. And uh, Bill, okay, I got you, got you, coach, got it, and, you know, went from there. 
So the uh, the play goes. So they go into overtime. The play goes deep into the Montreal end, and uh, here we go. The puck's in behind the net. Howie Meeker has got the puck behind the net. He tries to center out front. It deflects off Butch Bouchard's skate, and it's lying not lying there, but it's uh, going towards the faceoff circle, just to the right of Jerry McNeil and the Montreal Canadiens net. And Broco now has to make a decision. If he if he hangs back, Maurice Richard will have the puck, and Richard certainly was a, a tremendous uh, goal scorer and tremendous player and intense, um, and so he'd, bo- uh, he'd bear down on the Leaf blue line and, and uh, have a chance. Or Bill can gamble against his coach's wishes and, and keep the puck in the, in the uh, Montreal Canadiens zone there. So he makes a quick decision, and he gambles. He skates in, backhands the puck, it goes over the shoulder of Jerry McNeil to win the game. The Leafs have won the Stanley Cup. They're fourth in five years. They're the fifth consecutive game decided in overtime. They beat the vaunted Montreal Canadiens. The, the, the players are lifting Bill on their shoulders. Uh, everybody's going crazy. They, they race out to center ice to, uh, to laud the hero. And Primo apparently whispers, and it may be more, more lore than anything, but apparently whispers, don't worry, Bill, I'm not going to fine you. And Bill, oh, thanks, Coach. There you go. He had gambled and he had won that particular time. Now, had he not reached the puck in time, Richard could have chipped it past the defenseman and had a had a break. And I don't know whether it had been a two-on-one or a three-on-one, but it certainly would have been a, an opportunity for the Montreal Canadiens. But he gambled and that particular time he won. And for a guy who didn't score a great number of goals, that goal was the most important one of his career and one of the most important in Toronto Maple Leafs history as well. If you want to hear the original call of that goal, check out sportsfh.com. I have a link to it there, and I also have a link to video of the goal as well. That cup was the closest Stanley Cup in history. Toronto won game one in overtime 3-2 to two, on a goal by Sid Smith. Montreal came back to win game two in overtime, three to two, on a goal by Maurice the Rocket Richard. Toronto won game three in overtime, two to one, and game four in overtime, three to two. Trailing two to one late in the third of game five, Todd Sloan scored the tying goal for Toronto, and then Barilko scored the cup clincher at 2.53 in overtime. What happened after the 1951 Stanley Cup tragically altered the landscape of the NHL, especially the Maple Leafs, who were the dominant team of the time. Once again, my conversation with Kevin Shea. Life was good for him at that time. Everything's going great, and he decides to take that fateful trip with Dr. Hudson. You know, as I read your book, there are so many signs leading up to the trip that if you add them all together... There's no way he should have ever stepped on that plane. I mean, eerie, eerie signs that he couldn't have known then. But when you piece it all together, it's like, wow, what was he thinking? Even 14 years earlier, didn't he have a cousin by the same name, Bill Barilko, who disappeared in a (laughs) forest? Only this one, fortunately, had a different outcome. Hudson was a risk taker. He took chances when he came to the fuel on the plane, the weight on the plane. The engine had caught fire previously. Uh, Hudson's friend, Archie Chenier, was on board for a few of those scary incidents, and he once said in an interview with the Toronto Sun, he, meaning Hudson, had no fear in his conscience when it came to judgment while flying. And that lack of fear might have been the main culprit in this tragic story. He should have never got on that plane. Yeah, you're right. The, the, this, the thing that we have to remember, though, is that it's, it's all in retrospect. So at the time, it was an adventure, and Bill was an adventurous guy. And here was a sportsman, a guy around northern Ontario who everybody liked, everybody trusted. Lou Hudson, uh, Henry's brother, was a, a well-known uh, athlete, hockey player himself. Henry wasn't an athlete per se, although he was a curler and things of that sort, but he was loved by all the sports guys because he was the guy who would take them to his cottage in North Bay or take them for a fishing trip or whatever it happened to be. So Bill is an adventurous guy who loved the lure of fishing, who had a little bit of time beforehand. I don't think he ever thought anything more than that. Hey, here's a chance for me to uh, to have one last adventure before we uh, head into training camp. And that year it was going to be in St. Catharines, as I recall. And, and uh, as we look back on it now, when you put all the pieces together, it was ridiculous. Neither of them should have gone at that particular time. And 
yet they did and and it was their last trip and and a very unfortunate one that uh that is looked back upon with with great irony but also looked back at as as uh, one of the great stories in a, in a most negative way one of the great stories in hockey history yeah I, just just uh briefly tell me about his cousin i mean that's that's crazy a cousin by the same name bill barilko he he disappeared in the forest as well yeah yeah, it's a funny story, and not a funny story, but it just the family was very, very close knit. You know, immigrant parents who who had come to this new land to to uh, to stake their place and uh, and find that the streets weren't paved with gold at all. In fact, in Timmins, they were they were more cold than gold. Um, Bill's dad was a, a chef for the the mining uh, companies there. His mom was a, a stay at home mother of of three, but they had cousins and aunts and uncles and pretend aunts and uncles, you know, friends of the family. And it was very, very close knit. They, they ate together, they shared together, they, uh, they socialized together. And, and so they were really, really close. And sure enough, there was a Bill Barocco and, and many thought it was the guy who would go on to be the famous hockey player. And when you go back over newspapers, your initial, your initial thought is, oh my God, Bill had an earlier near tragedy as well, but in fact, it was his cousin, Bill Barocco. And, and uh, you know, you have to think that Northern Ontario is a vast, wide open, cold, desolate, in many ways, uh, place up there. And and uh, the, the junior Bill wandered off into the, the dense forest and, and was lost there. You know, he ultimately came back, but uh, was, was discovered. But he he was lost there, and it started a manhunt of a different sort, not of the magnitude of Bill Baroque or the hockey players, but it, it had a manhunt as well, people combing through the area, trying to find this young man before the, the cold of the weather was going to, uh, to come in and, and uh, compromise things. But anyway, he was found ultimately. But yeah, that was his cousin, Bill Barocco. And And the Bill Barocco we're speaking about, when that plane disappeared, that search went on for a long time, and I think you had mentioned it earlier. It was one of the largest searches, if not the largest search to date. I don't know, you know, since then. But even the Royal Canadian Air Force was called in to search, and that was the largest search they had ever performed. Yeah, it really was. It was hard to believe that <clears throat> that a lost plane couldn't be found. It was incomprehensible, and especially one that had two... two uh, uh, occupants who were very well known in their own way, uh, you know, a dentist and a, and a hockey player, a famous hockey player at that. So it was hard to believe that you couldn't find, but you have to remember, uh, and I'm talking about for the listeners, you have to remember that, that the forests of this area are incredibly dense. The trees are jam packed together. It's all swamp. It's all, it's all muskeg. Uh, the, the winter months uh, extend into the what we would consider the spring and and early fall as well, and uh, so it's really really difficult to find things that are are lost in that area. Having said that, as you mentioned, the Royal Canadian Air Force is searching uh, continually. They they search diligently until the the winter hit, and they just couldn't look anymore that that year alone. But the search continued every single time that the uh, the weather would break. They'd be back out looking again the next spring through the summer and into the fall. And then have to shut it down again. Uh, Con Smythe in 1951 put up a, a personal reward of ten thousand dollars. Again, not an um, insignificant amount, but for those who can uh, lead to the discovery of Barocco and Hudson, and you know it lapsed before before the the uh, skeletons were found. But uh, again, this was a, a major story, and and the story played out every year. Bill's mother laid out his clothes every year again. You know, she. She would uh, do what most mothers did at that time, take the summer clothes and put them in mothballs through the winter and pull out the winter clothes and, and ironed his suits and his winter clothes and whatever every year because she believed that Bill was going to be found and come back and never, ever gave up hope until that very, very last time when the daughter had to tell her they found Bill and, and he's, uh, he's gone. So she gave she continued her hope and, and gave hope right through those 11 years when they couldn't find. She was the only one, of course, but, uh, but it was a, a longstanding, you know, intense, intense search for Burlco and Hudson. And that's the craziest part of this story is the 11 years. He scores the game winning goal, the Stanley cup clinching goal against the Montreal Canadians. 
They don't find him for 11 years. The The Leafs, they don't win a Stanley Cup during that period. They win the Cup in 62, and then they find the plane. The curse is lifted. It's a crazy story. Yeah, it's, it is, you know, honestly, and, and it's such a cliche, but if you were to write this, if, you're, if you were a screenwriter and you were to write it, people would dismiss it as too ludicrous, too wild, and yet this is all absolute fact. You know, the Leafs went into the, uh, continued through the 50s. Losing Barocca was a, a major, major blow to the organization. He was, he was loved. Um, you don't replace him easily. They started off by replacing Broco on the blue line with a guy named Hugh Bolton. Bolton ran into some some uh, injury problems. So ultimately, Broco's spot was replaced by Tim Horton. Interesting that uh, that when Bill – they had a service for Bill when he wasn't found. And and uh, one of his dear friends, Alan Stanley, was uh, was one of the gentlemen who – who uh, was close to him. He, he was included in the searches as well. When Bill's body was found, um, they had a, a service for his skeletal remains, and, and he was buried in Timmins, and Alan Stanley was one of the, the honorary pallbearers at that particular time. Another irony is the fact that when Tim Horton died in the 1970s, he, he in a single car crash, Alan Stanley, his defense partner, was the Paul Bearer for Burilko's replacement, too. Wow. So, I mean, it continues on, and it's just so eerie and odd. But um, but back to the, the whole Burilko side of things, I mean, you can't you can't replace him easily. Tim Horton had been kicking around. He'd been with the, uh, the Pittsburgh Hornets, was a, a very good player, and he stepped in. But the team was starting to change. You know, teams age, players move on. They retire, they, they get traded to other teams. And so the 1950s weren't especially good to the Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, they made the playoffs, but they never advanced past the first round. And, and it was tricky through the, uh, through until 1959 when Punch Imlac comes along. But it, it, it was not a, a great time for the Maple Leafs. The Detroit Red Wings had their own dynasty. And, of course, the uh, Montreal Canadiens win five Stanley Cup championships in a row as well. So, so Toronto gets usurped by Detroit and Montreal. They're, they're fierce rivals. But what ends up happening is, you know, there's ebbs and flows for every team. And uh, we talked about junior affiliates earlier. The St. Michael's majors were, were uh, developing terrific talent. So was their other junior A affiliate was the uh, Toronto Marlboros. And so players from those teams were, uh, were making their entrance to the Toronto Maple Leafs by the late 50s and early 60s. Names like Frank Mahovlich, Dave Keon, Billy Harris. Uh, it goes on and on and on. Bob Bond, Carl Brewer. I mean, I could go on forever. And, and so these are the players who are now carrying the torch for the Toronto Maple Leafs through the 1960s. And in fact, would be at the nucleus of, uh, of the next dynasty for the Toronto Maple Leafs. But from 1951, when Barocco scored the Stanley Cup winning goal, until 1962, when the Leafs next win their Stanley Cup championship, they hadn't been great, but they had been evolving through that time. And yeah, they win the Cup in 62. They find Barilko's body. The curse is lifted, and and uh, the Leafs went on to win four Stanley Cups in seven seasons that time. Unbelievable! Like that here, yeah, yeah, it really was. It really was. You know, so they did. They found the plane in '62, and the plane was finally recovered and brought back to Timmins on October 16th, 2011, 60 years after it had crashed. Have you seen it? And if so, what did it mean to you to see the wreckage? What did you think about when you saw it? Yeah, yeah, it, it was, you know, I have a great deal of faith. And, and you know, I reverted to that. It was, a, so, first of all, I was blessed to be asked to go, but having been a Barocco's biographer, I guess it made some sense. But, you know, in 62, a handful of people had gone and found the plane and there was a a gentleman who was writing for the Toronto Telegram at the time who who I got a chance to spend some time with before his death. And he told me the same sort of thing is, you know, he wasn't necessarily a man of faith, but he, he was a guy who all of a sudden realized that he was at the site where two men lost their lives, two two significant men lost their lives. And there's an eeriness there. And, and it's, Again, it's this vast wilderness and, and all of this, this crazy northern Ontario geography right there. And then you see the plane, and it's, it's virtually intact. I mean, there's no rust. I guess it's part of the fact that it was aluminum for the most part. Um, you know, you can see that parts of it were scattered a little bit uh, around the, the perimeter of the area. I can only guess that animals had, had found the site as well. But for the most part, 
you know, there it was, you know, the fuselage, the motor, everything intact for the most part. Again, certainly a great impact, but almost perpendicular in the ground. So nobody went to um, to the site again for a, a fair bit of time. And I, I can't remember what year it was necessarily, but it was quite some time later. And and they found the site and they put up a marker and uh, that this was the site where Bill Barocco and Dr. Henry Hudson had lost their lives. And hmm. they did a smudging ceremony and they did a number of things just to, to honor the site and decided to leave things as they were. But again, and as you had mentioned as well, you know, several years later, many years later, they decided that well, there was reasons for it too, but they decided to pull the wreckage out of the uh, out of the area. One was that the area is owned by a, 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 a logging company, and they were going to start to log that area, and so the area would be lost to all time if they didn't pull the wreckage out. And so it was important. It was also a very very expensive venture too, and they had to involve cranes and helicopters and and uh, all kinds of uh, of things in order to do it. But to be asked to go up there, I, um, Bill's sister, Anne, wasn't well enough to go at that time. She she has since passed away, but she, you know, she just didn't have the wherewithal to land a mile away, walk in through through the area. And I, I think she just wanted to keep Bill's memory intact in her mind, too. And I don't know that she really wanted to see where Bill had lost his life. So actually, Bill's cousin uh, was the only relative who went. I went. There were there were uh, uh, there was a newspaper gentleman from North Bay who went who had chronicled the story earlier. He'd been on an earlier flight there, and then a number of people who were involved with the the reclaiming of the wreckage. And but to go there, and, and it was a very solemn sight. And we all stood there for a moment and said our our own little silent prayers or our own little our, our own little quiet thoughts or reminisced or whatever we did reflected. But it was very eerie and 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 wonderful at the same time that. Uh, that you know, here was a spot had been found, and and uh, so I spent a few minutes doing that, and then we went to work, and uh, and they were able to pull the the fuselage out of the ground. It had been all but cemented there through those those many years, and yeah, I feel melancholy about it. I, you know, in many ways, I wish it had been left intact, uh, but but I understand why it was taken. It went to a warehouse in Timmins and is still there. They're trying to find a home for it, but it's one of those weird things. First of all, it's a great it's not huge, but it's you know it would take up a great deal of space in a in a museum uh, at a place like the Hockey Hall of Fame or in a, a Northern Ontario Heritage Site or whatever it happened to be, and and it would also be quite expensive that way too. But it's also where two people lost their lives, and I'm not sure that I don't know. I, I'm I'm on the fence about that, but uh, but anyway, it's it's in a in a warehouse now. Um, CBC Television has is Canadian Broadcasting Corporation Television has has gone and done a, a piece about it, but just to look at it and just you know to see the you know it's aluminum, it's somewhat flimsy, but there it is, and there's all the parts that went with it, and you know uh, it's it just really hard to to believe, but but it's been reclaimed now and it's it's there and trying to find a home. I don't know how hard they're looking now, but I know they looked very hard for a while. There have been several people, CTV in, in you know, Canada, in, based out of Toronto, is looking at doing a, a special on the the whole story, including the reclamation project. Uh, there's talk about movies and things like that, but you know the story continues to live on through podcasts like yours, through music of a band called The Tragically Hip, who had a song called 50 Mission Cap that really helped bring the, the story back to life for a whole new generation. Uh, the story continues on, and for a guy whose career probably should have been an asterisk in the in the uh, Toronto Maple Leaf media guides, his uh, his name and his legacy continue on to this day, and we talk about him with great affection and and uh, and and great reverence, and and think about what he contributed to the team, about a special era, and about a special guy during that era. Yeah, why is that? Why is there such a reverence about Bill Barilko? Other athletes have tragically lost their lives at the height of their career, and yet this continues. The Bill Barilko story is, you know, people, the people from Timmins, Toronto, they love him. What, where does that love come from? Why is the Bill Barilko, why does the Bill Barilko story continue to live on? The story is so darn dramatic. <laughs> I mean, it really, really is. As we we mentioned earlier, I mean, you couldn't create a story in a vacuum and have people believe it. You know, uh, a, a, a less than than stellar hockey player finding his way to Hollywood, 
coming into Toronto and being a star for the Stanley Cup champion, Toronto Maple Leafs, a, bo- a boy of no means, you know, a, just a, a poor boy from Northern Ontario, a boy who is loved by his teammates, loved by the fans, a fan favorite, who scores the Stanley Cup winning goal and then uh, tragically dies that summer and the curse of Barocco continues on. When you put the whole story together, it is beyond comprehension. And it's one of those great stories that people hang their hats on. It's just so dramatic. I mentioned a band, uh, a Canadian band called the Tragically Hip. And they are arguably one of Canada's biggest bands of all time. Um, and they recorded a song, as I mentioned, 50 Mission Cap. And, and they they literally took the story from a, a hockey card. You know, the lead singer, Gord Downey, who's also the lyricist, a terrific poet in, in many ways, uh, took the back of a hockey card, didn't know much about Barocco, but took the story and turned it into a song that's one of the most played songs in Canadian music history. And and it's one of those things, because we've all heard it on the radio 10,000 times, if not more, we know the story of Bill Barocco too. So whether you're a hockey historian, uh, a casual hockey fan, or a music fan, you know the name Barocco. You know the story, even in its most uh, skeletal, and I don't mean to use that pun, sorry, but uh, not a pun, but use that term, um, but in its, in its own sort of way, Bill Barocco scored the goal that won the Leafs the Cup. They didn't win another until 1962, the year that he was discovered. You know, it's, you, when you boil it down, that's the story, and you know it from the song, you know it from the legend. And so the legend of Bill Barocco, the most dramatic story in, in Toronto Maple Leafs history, history arguably the the greatest goal in Stanley Cup history, or certainly one right up there, arguably the greatest goal in Toronto Maple Leafs history, all of those things converge together, and and we still remember Bill Barocco in 2017. Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Hey, what are you working on right now? Uh, Where can uh, fans of Sports Forgotten Heroes get their hands on more of your work? Well, geez, I appreciate it. First off, before I even answer that, I have to tell you how much I enjoyed the conversation. You've done your homework and done it really, really well, and you've Thank turned you. what could be a could be a you know a, a nice ten minute conversation into really an all encompassing and wonderful uh, an hour. And and I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my most recent book is the Toronto Maple Leaf Hockey Club, um, the the official centennial publication, nineteen seventeen to two thousand seventeen. And it's available at better bookstores everywhere, but uh, we include certainly all the great stories about the Toronto Maple Leafs, but include the Bill Barocco story in the book as well. And so that came out last October, and I'm I'm very honored to have been chosen to to write the official centennial history of the Toronto Maple Leaf Hockey Club. Terrific. Well, thanks again, Kevin. I hope you'll come back sometime in the future for a discussion on another forgotten hero from the NHL. Thank you so much. It would be my honor, and and good luck with things, and thank you for everything. You're a terrific, terrific guy to talk to. So Bill Barocco only played five years in the NHL, and actually his first year he only played in 18 games. But he certainly left his mark. Overall, he scored 26 goals and added 36 assists. He led the league in penalty minutes in his first full season with 147. He added five goals in the playoffs, with the biggest being that goal in overtime to win the Cup for Toronto in 1951. Bill played in three All-Star games, 1947, 1948, and 1949, and his number five hangs high in the rafters in the Air Canada Centre. No telling how far his career could have taken him and whether or not induction into the Hall of Fame could have happened. But without a doubt, Bill Barocco embodied the true definition of what a sport hero should be. Next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes, another tragic story, but a different kind of tragic. We will take a look back at the career of baseball's Ed Delahanty. Big Ed has the fifth highest batting average of all time. For more on Sports Forgotten Heroes and to see who else will be featured on a future episode, check out sportsfh.com. To show your support for the podcast, please visit patreon.com backslash sportsfh. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com backslash sportsfh. You can follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at Sports F Heroes and on Facebook on the Sports Forgotten Heroes page. 
thanks again to my guest, Kevin Shea, and we'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.